Let's turn to Romans this morning. We're going to be in Romans chapter 12. Now, I've tried to meet all of you, but if I haven't met you yet, now is the time where you have to come up to me and say, hey, you haven't met me yet, and you're not going to be bothering me. I want to be bothered, so come introduce yourself if I haven't met you yet. If you've been praying for Mary Hartley, she is feeling better. If you didn't know, she had a stroke on Friday, and it was a mild stroke, but the doctors say she was very fortunate on her health and how she made it through it but she's hoping to come home today she said she was going to watch the service so mary if you're watching this one everybody say hi mary <laughs> we'll be praying for you mary all right romans 12 starting with verse 1 therefore i, ur I urge you brothers and sisters in view of god's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to god this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This two-part sermon series is a little R&R. &R. Does anybody remember what the R was from last week? it was rest and so we have another r to go along with rest this morning but as we always do let's say a word of prayer and i'm going to ask that you pray for me that i can deliver god's word this morning and i'm going to pray that you and i receive it as i do so let's pray together Father, I love how beautifully you set the stage for us to deliver, to receive your word. I love the worship and what it does for us as a body, what it does for us as a people, how it moves us to Christ. So right now, Lord, as we open your word, we pray that it is alive and powerful and moves and shakes and shapes us to that of your son, Jesus, because it's in his name we pray. Amen. As a kid, growing up, I always had odd jobs. My dad was really good at finding me jobs, usually pulling weeds in somebody's front yard or backyard or painting a fence or painting the outside of a house, sanding down something. I always had odd jobs growing up as a child and into my teen years. And when I'd work these jobs, there was a problem. I never took breaks, ever. Now you're probably thinking, oh, he's already trying to make himself look good, like he's a hard worker. I was a hard worker, but that is why I, that's not why I didn't take breaks. It had nothing to do with being a hard worker. I didn't take breaks because I was an idiot, because I was scared and paranoid to take a break. I always thought that if I took a break, that's exactly when the person who hired me would come out of the house and see me sitting there. Was anybody else paranoid to take a break? Okay, a few of you know what I'm talking about. I was too scared to take a break. And if the person who hired me came out and see me, and I was working like in the desert, 100 degree weather, they would say, hey, you should take a break. But my mind told me, oh, this might be a test. No, no, that's okay. You know, I always thought I had to say, no, that's okay. I don't need a break. And I would never took breaks. The people, I look back, no one would have minded if I did. Everyone expects you to take a break, but I would work all afternoon. I could take a break. I could take a rest, but I didn't take a rest. Last week, we talked about what it takes to enter God's rest. Jesus says, I have rest for you. God says, you can enter my rest if you listen, if you follow me. And the Israelites in the wilderness, they were never able to enter God's rest because they weren't listening. Jesus says, I need you to take on my yoke. I need you to learn from me, and I have rest for you. There's a criteria. There is to enable to enter this rest that God has, that Christ has for us. We have to be listening and learning and following and obeying. 
But what happens if a Christian is listening and is obeying? What if you are obeying and listening, but what if you did not enter his rest even though you could? What if you were like Brent working those jobs in elementary school where you are able to rest, but you're choosing not to? You're not taking the time. You're not stopping and entering God's rest. That is a reality, unfortunately, with us who follow Christ. Some of us are able to enter God's rest because we do listen as best we can and we do respond as best we can and God's saying my rest is available but some of us don't enter that rest often enough now all of you are entering God's rest right now Troy right now is in God's rest give Troy a round of applause good job Troy you did it Troy all of us we could clap for all of us we are entering God's rest but what about tomorrow what about Tuesday what about Wednesday that's what we're looking at today let's talk more about God's rest how we must choose to enter it and what it does for us we really that'll cause us to want to be there if we truly realize what his rest will do for us so we just have two verses this morning but these are loaded verses someone asked me this morning ah you got a lot of verses for us this morning i said i got two but these are packed these are mega mega verses so let's look at them verse one shows us that we're in the right place therefore i urge you brother and sisters in view of god's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to god not a dead sacrifice that the jews were used to you are a living sacrifice you are to give yourself to god you are to make yourself available to god you are to present yourself to god that's what it takes to enter his rest that is exact opposite of what the israelites in the wilderness were doing they were not being living sacrifices to god they were not presenting themselves to god they were not listening they were not learning from god we have to make ourselves a living sacrifice jesus says take my yoke learn from me that is being a living sacrifice presenting yourself available for god face it you're going to be a living sacrifice to something in this life you're either going to be a sacrifice to god you give god yourself and the world gets whatever's left after god takes and instructs or you're going to give yourself to the world be a living sacrifice to the world and then god has to try to take whatever's left which is it going to be the world or god either the world is going to run you ragged or you're going to run ragged to the lord for rest what kind of living sacrifice are you do you present yourself to the world or do you present yourself to the lord and because of that do you feel you represent the world or do you represent the lord because whatever you give yourself over to as a living sacrifice that is what you are going to start representing now i know we all want to say i represent the lord i give myself over to the lord but if the people at work had to vote would they see you more as representing the world or representing this Jesus Christ? If the kids at school took a vote, if the people in your neighborhood, if the people in your own family had to take a vote, who you represent in the home? Are you representing the world or are you representing the Lord? Because that is what God's rest is going to do to you. It's going to help you represent the Lord. That is a direct function. That is a direct result of entering God's rest. It is going to help you represent Jesus Christ. It's going to make you unlike the world, and it's going to make you more like him. It tells us that in verse 2. Do not conform 
to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You want a little R&R, you need rest and you need renewal. The second R is renewal. That's what God's rest is going to do for you. It's going to transform you. It's going to renew you. That's how we don't conform to the world. You're either conforming to the world or you're conforming to God. Living in this fallen world, naturally, you are going to become more like this world. If you are of this world, you are going to conform to this world. But it's when we enter God's rest that we no longer are of this world. We get transformed. We get conformed to who God is. We get that renewal. We conform to God. And just like living sacrifices, we're either conforming to the world or we're conforming to God. That's why Paul tells us in other books, in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, he says we need to be renewed day by day, every day. Because every day you're either being conformed to this world or you're being conformed to God. And that's why it's good that we're here together in God's house, entering his rest right now. Because right now, if your heart is open, you're listening to these songs, you're worshiping as, as we're singing scripture this morning in the courses and the songs and the hymns we sang this morning. And if your heart is open to his message right now as I speak, you are in God's rest. You are being renewed. You are taking on God's mindset. He is shaping you. He is focusing you on him. But as I said before, if you're not doing it day by day, what happens tomorrow? What happens tomorrow if we don't take any time for God? And it's not about what you give more time to. It's not about, well, I work for eight hours, so I got to give God nine. You know, you give God some moments before you go to that eight-hour shift. He's going to reshape and renew you and transform you, and you are going to be a different person heading into that job for eight hours. Do we give God time, a moment, to renew us? Do we enter his rest tomorrow? or Tuesday because if we go to church one day a week and we never enter God's rest six days a week which pattern do you think we're going to take more which who, who are we going to conform to more the world six days a week or God one day a week we have to keep going to God every day we got to make time every day to enter God's rest when we allow ourselves to enter God's rest, when God transforms and renews us every day, he pulls us out of the world, and look what it leads to. Verse 2, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Being transformed, entering God's rest, leads to a good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do you think the majority of people in this world describe the pattern of this world as good, pleasing, and perfect? When you watch an hour of the news at night, do you turn off the television and say, wow, I live in a good, pleasing, and perfect world? Is that ever your reaction? Is that ever your reaction when you get off social media, when you get off Facebook? Do you ever think, wow, that was such a good, pleasing, and perfect experience? Probably not. Do you think the high school kids in high school, would, if they voted, they would say, well, we vote that this world is good, pleasing, and perfect. Is that how teenagers, all teenagers, would describe their lives? Is that how your coworkers would describe their day at work, good, pleasing, and perfect? That's not what the world offers. But when we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice when we enter God's rest, when we escape the world's pattern, when we are transformed and renewed, that's going to lead to a life where despite the problems, despite the struggles, despite when we're in the hospital, despite when we have 
worries and things, we give them to Christ, we enter his rest, and we are going to be able to experience something that is good, pleasing, and perfect, and his name is Jesus Christ. We will always have something good, pleasing, and perfect in this world when we enter Jesus' rest, and we're not going to be able to receive it anywhere else. Jesus in the New Testament was all about renewing people. That's the business Jesus was in. And folks, he's still in the same business of renewing people. But we must go to him. We can't get that renewal on our own. It doesn't come automatically. There's that sitcom, The Office. Anybody ever watch The Office? There's a character on it named Dwight Schrute. And he says he only tips people if they can do something he can't do for himself. And so he tips his urologist because he says he can't pulverize his own kidney stones. And you know what? You have to go to Jesus because you cannot bring rest and renewal and transformation to yourself no matter how much you love him. You have to enter his rest. You have to go to Jesus to receive the rest and renewal. And you say, well, tomorrow, pastor, I, I'm so busy. Tuesday, I'm busy. I can do it Sunday. I can make the Bible study on Wednesday. I can go to youth group. But Thursdays, man, I'm so busy. And I say, on Thursdays, do you brush your teeth? I hope so. I say, this week, do you shower? And you say, yes, because I have to do those things. Those things are essential. And that's what I'm telling you this morning is the rest of Jesus Christ is essential to your day. More essential than brushing your teeth. More essential than taking a shower. Entering Jesus' rest and being renewed for that day is essential. And I tell you what, moms and dads, putting dinner, getting dinner on the table 10 minutes later so that you can spend a few moments with Christ in his rest would be worth it because you are going to have a refreshed and renewed follower of Christ sitting at dinner with your children ministering to them. That would be worth dinner being a little late. It's worth turning on the television or turning on Facebook a little bit later than you normally would so that you can enter that rest of Jesus Christ, so that you can be renewed and refreshed in Christ for your spouse. It's worth it to, for a teenager not to maybe be on their phone on that drive to school, put the phone away, spend some time talking to Jesus, enter his rest so that a renewed and refreshed teenager can walk on that campus. We need teenagers renewed by Jesus Christ walking on our school campuses. Amen? That's what we need. That's what we need. It's got to be essential. Have you ever heard of Martin Short? This is Martin Short right here. He's the one sitting on the desk with the microphone. He's a comedian throughout the 80s and 90s. He's still going. There's one thing about Martin Short, one thing he's been known for. He's known as an incredible guest on the talk shows. He's, his whole career, he's been known, he's so comfortable and funny and hilarious on talk shows. And not all celebrities can do that. Some celebrities get on there and it's live and they're not acting and the crowd's there and the cameras are on and they get real nervous. But Martin Short, for his whole career, even when he started out, he's been a natural on these talk shows. And he was interviewed one time and he was asked, how come you're so good on these talk shows? How come you've always been so funny and natural on talk shows? And he shared a secret. He said, when I first entered show business, I studied the late night talk show host, Johnny Carson, Jack Parr. He said, I studied them and I realized that in order for me to be as good as they were on live television, I needed to be acting the whole time I'm on an interview show. 
And so when he goes on these shows, he says, I am nervous and I am scared in front of the crowd, in front of the cameras. But as soon as I walk out, I am acting as someone who's not scared. I am acting as someone who is relaxed and funny. I'm acting the whole time. I'm afraid that some of us who follow Jesus Christ, who love Jesus Christ, I'm afraid some of us get so busy we do not enter his rest. And when we come and when we're around other believers, when we come here on Sundays, when we're around people, we act like a rested, renewed Christian instead of being truly rested and renewed. My fear is that we just, we know how to act. And it's not that we're being fake. It's just we know we need to be uplifting and we need to be full of joy. And so we just make that happen. But it's not coming from a real place of being renewed and transformed by Jesus. Because we're acting renewed and we're acting joyful. But inside we're stressed and worried and we're burdened. We haven't given it over to Jesus in his rest worried stressed burdened that sounds more like the pattern of this world and not like the pattern of Jesus Christ do we enter his rest I have a final thought for you and it's in verse 1 look at verse 1 I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God this is your true and proper worship. Entering into the rest of Jesus Christ, being renewed and transformed, that is a part, as Paul puts it, of your true and proper worship. Now, we struggle a little bit with that translation because of how we've kind of made worship. And I'm not saying this is bad, but a lot of times we, when we think about worship nowadays, we think about music and singing. That's just worship. This is a worship service. You know, we're going to worship right now. We just associate it. But Paul is saying this is true and proper worship. Do you know what the, the Greek translation is for what Paul is saying? Do you know what he specifically said? He said, entering this rest, being a living sacrifice like this, is your divine service. Or you could say your spiritual act or your religious ritual. That, that's the heaviness he's using. He's saying doing this is a divine act. It is a religious ritual. There was a teacher that was teaching a class, and she said, how many of you kids are religious? And four kids raised their hand. And she said, tomorrow can all four of you bring in something um, that shows um, something you do religiously. And so the kids all said yes. So the next day she had all four kids stand up. And the first kid, she said, okay, show us what you brought. And the first kid, he was a Muslim. And he stepped forward and he held up a prayer rug. And the teacher said, thank you. And she asked for the next kid. And the next girl, she was a Catholic. And so she stepped forward and she held up rosary beads. And the teacher said, thank you, next. And then the next kid was Jewish. And she stood up and she held up menorah candles. And she said, thank you. And she said, and the last one, and this little boy was from Grace Point. And he stood up and he held up a crock pot. <laughs> a little slow on that one, that's okay. I hope we have better religious acts than crockpots and potlucks. But you know what? We have a better religious act than a prayer rug. We have a better religious act than rosary beads. We have a better religious act than candles. Our greatest religious act, as Paul says, is entering into the rest of Jesus Christ and being renewed and being refreshed being transformed that is our religious act we don't hang beads from our rearview window we it's not about 
having a cross placed in every corner of your home, the greatest religious act you can do is entering into the rest of Jesus Christ every day. That is your religious act in being transformed. Can you make the time? It doesn't start today because you're in the rest right now. Can you make the time tomorrow? I'm going to ask if the praise team would come up. We're going to close in song. My second year of college, I came home from the summer, and there was a contractor in the church, and he hired me to be a grunt for the summer. He was building houses, and he had his crew, and I joined the crew, and I was the guy.